Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to The Fluff and Hammer Does, The Ages of Chaos, in which I'll be having a look at the various tomes and volumes relating to chaos in all of its various and glorious forms in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, the old world that was, and indeed in the realms of AOS. Now, following on from Realms of Chaos Slaves to Darkness, we have the second tome in this volume. Chaos, uh, at the very beginning, chaos was such a vast force. It, it comprised so, so much that it required two enormous volumes and i mean these things are huge they're hardback this one is how many pages long 296 pages long it's longer than than many novels this thing and this is the second volume this is realm of chaos the lost and the damned which deals primarily but not exclusively with the forces of zeech and nurgle just as the realms of chaos slaves to darkness did uh slanesh and corn now one of the more interesting things about this book is it was a, it was many mentioned in Realms of Chaos Slaves to Darkness, but it, it was some years after the publication of Slaves to Darkness that this book, The Lost and the Damned, came out. This was published in 1990, uh, which was two or three years after Slaves to Darkness, and as a result, things have changed. The state of play has changed. The background has changed enormously. This book, although it's related aesthetically, it still has all of the wonderful sort of naive late 1980s early 1990s grim darkness about it the sort of occult stuff all around the edges of the pages the little wonderful little bits of art and icons and profane symbols and all sorts of stuff throughout this is surprisingly quite a different book from slaves to darkness it's different in terms of its format for one thing there's just more of it there's just way more of it this book is way more coherent than slaves to darkness because of course slaves to darkness was the first of its kind by this point there were other books out they had actually started to not necessarily format but kind of formalize the way they were publishing their work it still has that wonderful sort of chucking everything at the wall and seeing what will stick quality about it so it is like Slaves to Darkness, incoherent and sort of all over the place. There's bits and pieces of artwork and, as I said, symbols of all sorts of the uh, the elements of the Chaos Gods, the aspects of the Chaos Gods, but also just general occult stuff spread throughout, which is really, really cool. And also bits and pieces of rules all over the place all over the place this isn't as incoherent as slaves to darkness it's not as difficult to use but it's still so complicated so ridiculously complicated one thing this book does try to do for both game systems because this this book actually deals with a number of different game systems just as slaves to darkness did it deals with rogue trader which was warhammer 40,000 at the time it deals with warhammer fantasy battle in its earliest forms and also with a uh, warhammer roleplay which was kind of the third big game system of the time, and that basically was D&D &D using the uh, setting of Warhammer or the Warhammer 40,000 universe. Um, it deals with all three of them, and not in a terribly coherent way. It's actually rather difficult to discern when it's talking about one or the other, because the game systems were related back then, much more so than they are now, although there is some overlap between AOS and 8th edition 40k. No, it, It's nowhere near the overlap that exists here. Here, they only have uh, the various entries, like the Great Unclean one, which I have open here. Um, it only has one entry for Fantasy Battle and Warhammer 40k. The stats are the same because they use the same basic stats and the same basic rule set, whereas the profile for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is totally different because they had different stats for that. It's, it's really rather tricky to use. That said, just like Slaves to Darkness, it's a wonderful book to read. It's, it's grungy and dark and has this real surreal quality to it. Uh, dealing with Nurgle and Zeech, it is arguably even nastier than the previous volume the the nurgle imagery in particular is foul in this book it's absolutely foul there are there is a wonderful picture on page 11 of nurgle himself which is one of my favorite pictures of nurgle um he is both in in this picture he is both a, he is both an entity and 
the realm in one that he's this he looks just like a giant great unclean one essentially just enormous immense great unclean one but he's so vast that there are stairwells and gantries and bridges and platforms leading into his gut through rents and sort of putrid wounds and sores in his belly and there are hordes of damned souls walking into him uh, the souls that were claimed by plague or by disease or that uh, were killed in his name or that gave in to despair. It's really kind of weird. It's really strange and rather wonderful. In fact, the section on Nurgle, which is the opening section, is most definitely definitely the strongest. At this point, it goes into great, great detail exploring the metaphysics of the Chaos Gods, which would actually go away for a little while. Um, certainly in Second Ed, that was sort of shunted to the back a little bit. But it goes into great detail exploring what the Chaos Gods are and what the warp is, what the realm of chaos is, i.e. that it's a sort of reflection of physical reality and indeed of the emotional and intellectual lives of the creatures that inhabit it. So this book describes the core emotions that the chaos gods are coalesced around and how it happens, how it works. And Nurgle, of course, his core emotion is despair. Now that might seem rather bizarre to those of you who know Nurgle rather well and enjoy him because Nurgle is a jovial and pleasant and happy-go-lucky kind of guy. He's affectionate towards his followers, he's he's um, voluble and in, he's theatrical, he loves his followers dearly. Um, and yet his core is despair. What this book describes is that his affection is itself uh it's kind of overweening sentiment it's the affection of an overprotective mother that induces neurosis and anxiety and despair in her offspring um it's the kind of affection that keeps children at home and clinging to the skirts rather than allowing them to go out there and explore and experience new things because that of course is the antithesis of nurgle he's not about the experience of new things and ex of expanding contexts that's zeech's domain because he's coalesced around hope rather than despair um what nurgle wants what nurgle inculcates in his followers is this incredible conservatism of spirit they start to operate within cycles within known cycles and familiar miseries just as nurgle's elemental aspects are cyclical so rather than breaking out of the cycles that doom them to despair and suffering and misery they become used to them and come to accept them and eventually they come to actually revel in them as some kind of ultimate truth and they actually nurgle's part of nurgle's blessing is that he twists the perceptions of his followers so they begin to see and perceive their wretched conditions as desirable and truthful and beautiful and something worth sharing um and that that is really interesting that for me makes nurgle one of the most psychologically complex chaos gods certainly in terms of the way his followers operate because of course on the face of it it's anathema to sanity to worship a god of disease and despair and suffering but when you look at it that way it's actually very easy to see how the followers of nurgle occur it's because they they don't begin actively worshipping him. They find themselves in conditions and states where they have no choice, where their, their minds and their perceptions are so distorted um, that that's, what, that's just what happens. That's when Nurgle snares you, when you're at your lowest ebb. But he's also the god of defiance of despair, so, operate, so not giving in to it, but keep, when you keep going when you won't stop, when you refuse to give in, even though everything rational and sane and every instinct tells you you should. And that's wonderful. You also get in here for the first time, and I love this, this is something that certainly went away for a very long time, and I mean a very long time, which is the notion of Nurgle as, of Nurgle's followers, of his demons, as incredibly theatrical and like a carnival when they spill into the material universe. That is made really overt in this book. There are entire sections dedicated to the carnivals of plague, the carnivals of despair, of great and clean ones leading these incredible parades of disease and the plague. There are pictures of the plague bearers dancing and singing and bringing their rapture, their, their dubious morbid rapture to the material realms. It's absolutely wonderful. And you've even got you again, like in Slaves to Darkness, you have all of this wonderful artwork that is 
bizarre. It's just totally surreal. I mean, a lot of the stuff relating to Nurgle isn't it is it isn't depicting battles like a lot of the stuff in the more recent in the more modern codexes do. It's it's just the 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 followers of Nurgle reveling in what they are and what they do, and I I just love that. I absolutely love that. There's a very distressing image of a plague bearer, for example, pulling a worm out of its gut, which is really rather pleasant and grotesque. Isn't that nice? You have. It seems to me that at this point they're really because the because the writers are reveling in this stuff because it's so new. They're pushing the boundaries. They're really pushing the boundaries. There's no conservatism here. So, for example, you get the beast of Nurgle for the first time, which are these, jo- their natures are in stark contrast to their appearance. In appearance, they're fucking horrific. They're absolutely horrific, but their attitudes and their natures are like dogs. They're like puppies. They're over-enthusiastic. They're friendly. They bound around the battlefield. Uh, and they love, they don't have enemies. They love the en- the entities that they kill. They actually, um, bound towards them and start spraying them with putrid vomit and and, and diseased pus until they stop moving. They just die from the miasma of disease around them. And then they get disappointed and bored and bound off to the next plaything. It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. You also get, and this is one of my favourite things that is sustained to this day, this is still in the background regarding Nurgle, which is Nurgle's rot, the disease which creates the plague bearers. Um, Another thing I love, by the way, and it's the first time it's established here, which is that plague bearers are not demons in the same way that most other demons are. They don't have immortal origins. They have mortal origins. They are actually mortal entities that have been consumed by the demon disease of Nurgle's rot, which rots not only their bodies, but their souls. It actually transforms them slowly into a plague bearer. So that's hideous, isn't it? It's a disease of the, of the soul as well as the body. But it's in current... Um, rule sets it's just like a it's a weapon or it's it's a it's a it's a psychic power and it just does things like it inflicts mortal wounds or something like that um here nurgle's rot is a disease that your characters carry and it has effects on them but other enemies that encounter them and even allies who aren't marked by nurgle can catch it by being in contact with them and because the game system is so different here it's more like a role-playing game so it's not that you fight a battle and that's the end of it, your armies go back on the shelf. No. Things like casualties and wounds and whatnot and mutations carry over. Your army is more like a character in D&D, so you have an army list and roster that changes from battle to battle, and certain things are consistent, and Nurgle's Rot is one of them. It progresses from battle to battle and has escalating effects, which is absolutely wonderful. I love that. Uh, Moving on, from Nurgle, because uh, as much as I adore Nurgle, there is a god in here, the second part of the book, the god that I adore. Probably, he he is sort of on the same level of, as Slanesh for me in terms of my affections. I adore Zeech, the changer of ways. And again, this is the first time that we had any kind of elaboration on who Zeech was and how he operated. So once again, it's florid, it's interesting. There's a fantastic picture on page 29 of Zeech himself uh, levitating in his great library above hordes of sorcerers and acolytes and he is a weird looking thing he is very disturbing he looks a bit like a big pink horror with faces crawling all over him and just as the psychological aspects and the elemental aspects of Nurgle are explored so too are those of Zeech and it's wonderful Zeech is the entire antithesis of Nurgle in the same way that Slanesh is the opposite of Korn Zeech is hope in the same way that Nurgle is despair, he is the passion for learning and knowledge and for changing one's condition, changing one's state. He's political activism, he's intellectualism, he's academia, he is he's magic and occultism and science and evolution. He's all of these drives and forces. He's the desire to make things more or better than they are. Um, but in him, that becomes corrupted. It becomes change for change's sake. Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. It's it's irrelevant relevant the the emphasis is almost on anarchy it's a kind of metaphysical anarchy that he uh, emphasizes the whole the whole thing about zeech is that he is kind of all the chaos gods he's the most legitimately chaotic because he's contradictory if he reached a point where he achieved whatever ineffable contradictory plans and schemes that he has then he would immediately undo them 
he would do something to change them because that's his nature he is change um and anarchy and randomness made manifest and i absolutely adore that i really do and i like the fact that a lot of his followers his followers are psychologically complex too because they often don't know they're following him that's the point you know and even and even if they feel as though they've been taken by him or as though he's puppet mastering them they defy him and that's what he promotes above all else because in that defiance in that desire to be self-willed that's where Zeech flourishes that's where he derives his power from he is the antithesis of Nurgle in that regard Nurgle is all his followers need to submit they need to submit to Nurgle at their lowest ebb that's the whole point whereas Zeech no his power derives from those that reach their lowest ebb and then defy it anyway. They keep going. They they do something. They still believe that they can change it. Araman is the best example of this. He he is like he's not in this book, by the way. Araman hasn't even been coalesced at this point. He's not even a concept. He's not even named. Unlike the likes of say Fabius Bile or Abaddon, Araman is not even a concept at this point. Um, but Araman. Araman is not a servant of Zeech, that's the irony of it. Not a willing one, anyway. He does not worship Zeech, he does not submit to Zeech. He hates Zeech, he hates chaos. And he's trying to free himself and his brothers from it. And of course, for that, Zeech loves him. Zeech revels in him, because he, he in, in that defiance, he actually feeds Zeech unwittingly, and does Zeech's will. It's really, it is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. You get the first descriptions of things like the Lords of Change and the Pink Horrors, which have remained remarkably consistent down the ages. Remarkably consistent, just as the Great Unclean Ones are theatrical and are um, affectionate towards their followers. The Lords of Change are inscrutable and are manipulative. They don't regard their followers with any anything like affection at all. They are they're amused by them. They're amused by them in the same way that ants would be would be amusing to a cruel and capricious child, to like a sociopathic child. Um, and that's how they operate. They are so metaphysical and so far and beyond waking reality in their perceptions and on the planes they operate that reality, waking reality, is sort of like a, a playground for them. They don't care about consequence at all. They will just prod and manipulate and change things to see what happens because they're curious. They're like Hannibal Lecter, in that regard that's that's the level that they operate on but they are also the demons that interact very willingly with human beings in the same way that keepers of secrets do and i love that i think that's really interesting again the artwork relating to zeech is really surreal i mean it just as they go like hyper gross and hyper disgusting with the Nurgle artwork. With Zeech, they just go surreal. They go bizarre. And once again, you have all of these weird elements. You have things like the the die 100 lists of mutations that can occur spontaneously or when certain circumstances occur within the game. It's so, so weird. There's all this extra stuff in here. Like there are narrative campaigns and die 100 systems for developing narrative campaigns and stuff like It's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. In in fact, the artwork, the artwork in this book is, if anything, even better than the artwork in the previous volume. There is a piece of artwork in this, interestingly enough, relating to Slanesh. It actually relates to the Emperor's children. Um, and it's some of the best artwork I've ever seen relating to them. It's distressing. It really is. It, it's, it's actually really unpleasant. It's got like a Slanesh marine that has a bovine head and is hermaphroditic and it's it's really kind of weird. It's really kind of strange, but I absolutely love it. I love it. I mean, I I advocate a return to the strangeness myself. I like the weird and surreal aspects of chaos. And if you are hankering for that, these books fulfill it. Oh my God, do these books fulfill it. Just amazingly. They're just weird. They're flat out bizarre. Now, one of the more interesting things that's in here, there's the origin of the Beastmen. All the stuff about the origins of the Beastmen and how the Beastmen oper beast operate is in here. You get the first mention of things like the Zarngor, which have made a recent reappearance in both AOS and in 40k, but which again went away for a very long time. Um, you get the background of things like Minotaurs and uh, Pestigors and Dragon Ogres and all of that stuff is in here. Um, oh, I've just found that bit of Slanesh artwork. And you know what? It's even more weird than I thought. It's It's got 
it's got the chaos space with the bovine head and the hermaphroditic body it's got like basically naked demonettes caressing their guns and it's it's all very symbolic and very phallic and very distressing very distressing indeed there's a a chaos cultist in the background that is bloated to the point of obscenity with a very labial slit in its belly and a snake is coming out of it it's really it's i love that stuff very barkarian very barkarian you also get for the first time a total explanation of the eye of terror in 40k you get an explanation of what that is and how that how that operates demon world you get the first mention of perturabo perturabo the demon primarch of the iron warriors but nothing else just to mention just a mention of him absolutely love that absolutely adore that oh man now the most interesting thing one of the most interesting things anyway the back of this book you've got the full history of the emperor and when i say the full history i mean loads of stuff i'd not most of it isn't canon anymore but some of it still is some of it is alluded to quite naughtily in the horus heresy books um you get his full origins where he comes from what he is and you also get what he intends you get his full history um i won't spoil it but for those of you who want to read it go and read it it's really interesting you even get um you get an army list for the, se the the sensei the sensei are human beings who have the emperor's blood in them they are actually de descended from bloodlines that he sired throughout history because the emperor has been around since prehistory so he's, he's lived throughout human history so he sired bloodlines so there are bloodlines of his that are still out there and which still produce children who are obviously hyper athletic and very beautiful and have psychic powers and so on and so forth you can play them in here they operate like chaos champions in exactly the same way as chaos champions but the emperor is their deity really really fascinating worth a look now one of the more interesting things on the 40k side for the first time because by this point things have changed in 40k so when slaves to darkness was published space marines were not space marines they were just they were just guys in power armor there was nothing that made them like genetically superior or engineered or anything like that they were just guys in power armor um and it was their power armor that made them special. And there were no Primarchs. There were just generals, named generals or lieutenants that led them. At this point, that has changed. Now, the Space Marines are the Space Marines and the Primarchs are the Primarchs. So for the first time, we get mentions of Mortarion. Um, and in this book, interestingly, you can make demon primarchs or demon princes the deities or the divinities of your armies. You can actually have them as your patron, as opposed to the chaos god themselves. And the th and the demon prince or demon primarch can gift their followers with their own gifts, which is really cool. You obviously have Magnus the Red mentioned for the first time in the Thousand Suns entry. But what's really interesting about the Thousand Suns entry is this is this is before the rubric of Aramad was ever invented so in this at this point the things that distinguish the thousand suns is that they're hyper mutated even more so than other chaos space marines and they have this aura of magic around them that helps the sorcerers amongst them to cast spells that's it they don't have anything else they're not rubric marines because that hasn't happened yet really fascinating eh? really really fascinating I love all that stuff. And what's really interesting is in the Thousand Sons and Death Guard army lists, you can take all the stuff from Warhammer Fantasy Battle. You can take dragons, you can take dragon ogres, you can take chaos knights even. All of that overlaps. You can take all of that stuff, um, which is really, really, really cool. Of the two books, this is the rarest. This is the most difficult one to get. It cost me a pretty penny, I can tell you. And my copy is just falling to bits. The spine is fucked. The whole thing is coming apart if you can get it get it it's absolutely wonderful of the two it is the superior book and well worth your time well 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 worth your time and it's it's just again that wonderful late 1980s early 1990s naivety where everyone working for games workshop was loving what they were doing clearly and had lots of fun inventing wild and wacky and new stuff and just let their imaginations go wild things were not as codified at this point now 
moving on in the next video will be interestingly enough this was a little bit before my time i didn't come in when these were available so i missed out on these but moving on my the, the next video will feature the point when i did leap on which would have been the um second edition warhammer 40,000 chaos codex and also the realm of chaos box set which came out for fantasy battle around the same time that's the point i came in so i will have a lot to talk about with both of those a lot to talk about so until then i hope you enjoyed and um i will speak to you soon bye bye